church, everyone. It is good to see you on this uh, this beautiful summer day. We have some announcements. Please join us for coffee time following the service. Also, this coming week we have Brigden Music Camp. And if you're interested, 7 p.m. Brigden Music Camp recital at Brigden Community Church. Also coming up, wait a minute, it's not, it's two weeks for communion, isn't it? Do you have another week? Oh, okay, good, that makes me feel better. Uh, there are just a very few spots left in the survivor camp, and do we still need snacks, Patsy, for Junior Day Camp? Shortcomings that come to mind. 
Lord, hear our silent prayers of confession. Forgiving God, we thank you for your grace and forgiveness. And may the power that raised Jesus from the dead help us to grow in your holy, life-giving ways. Amen. And our opening hymn is entitled, Worship the Lord.
hacer?
It is now story time. Does anyone remember the story of Rahab? Put your hands up if you remember the story of Rahab. All right. So, it all starts like this. Joshua sent a couple of spies to go look over the land, especially Jericho. And they went and entered into Jericho. And in Jericho they found a house that was run by Rahab, the prostitute. Because apparently there was a lot of coming and going there. The king of Jericho was told about this, that these Israelite spies had arrived, so he sent his guards to go and see if they could capture them. But when the guards showed up and talked to Rahab, she said, they were here, but they're gone. If you hurry, maybe you can catch them. But they weren't gone. They were being hidden up on the roof, in the thatch of the roof. And as she were hiding up there, she went up and spoke to them and said these words, I know that the Lord has given you this land, and that a great fear has fallen on us, so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And we saw what you did to Sihon and Og, oh, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan River, whom you completely destroyed. The Lord, your God, is God in heaven and on earth below. So, please, swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family, because I have shown kindness to you. Their response from the spies, our lives for your life. We will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us this land. And as she was helping them escape down out of the wall, in, away from Jericho, they gave her this advice. Tie a scarlet cord so we can recognize you. She agreed, and, and, they, and they waited. Now, when they did attack, guess what? They found that scarlet cord, and Rahab and her family were saved because they trusted in the Lord. Now, who knows? Remember what Rahab's employment was? She was a prostitute. The children of Israel already had the Ten Commandments. This is not good. But she changed and apparently gave up the gods of the Canaanites. Probably Baal and Ashtoreth, the god of the goddess. And she believed that the Lord God was the one who was the real God. And what's interesting, and we're going to talk about it later on in the service, is that as she started to worship a different God, she lived differently. Her life changed. And so when we listen to and trust in the Lord, we begin to live in the ways that He teaches us. We begin to reflect His kind of love. So where do we learn about the ways of the Lord? Anybody? Pardon? In the Bible stories, absolutely. And so we can read Bible stories at home. Where else do we hear generally get together and read about and learn about Bible stories? The church, in Bible study, in various places, even in summer camps. And where and so as we learn. We have a choice. Do we listen and trust or not? Rahab and her family trusted in the Lord. And when the walls fell down, they lived. Enjoy the people of God. We'll talk more about that a little later. So if I, let's pray, and you can repeat after me. 
Dear God, as Rahab came to put her faith in you, even though she was not an Israelite, she was able to join your family and become your child and become an Israelite. Help us to trust in you as Rahab did so we can grow as your children.
uproot her entire family and put them in place outside the camp of Israel. Our response reading is Psalms 16, verse 26. Addiction Recovery Group, 
describes that religious faith has a significant impact on addiction. It tells us that according to studies in the National Institute of Health, vast psychiatric and psychological research credits religion as a source of resilience in long-term sobriety. People who have had a religious affiliation or describe themselves as spiritual are less likely to use drugs in the first place or relapse. And while not everyone is comfortable with this fact, there are several benefits of religion during addiction recovery, which are faith communities can be supportive and welcoming to people in recovery. As our society is becoming more secular, I'm realizing that the idea of people messing up, getting forgiven, and giving a second or third chance to learn how to live rightly and well is less popular as our faith goes down. In fact, it's really primarily in Christian and, and Jewish faith that the idea of forgiveness is central. Other world religions have other characteristics, other values is more central. Secondly, messages of unconditional love and acceptance are helpful for people in recovery. Yeah, you messed up, but we love you, you are loved, let's try again, is central to the gospel message. And personal faith can provide a moral foundation for new behaviors. Yeah, I know this is what I'm supposed to do. God tells me this, even if I keep filing short. It's easy to sometimes just say, oh, those rules are ridiculous. We need to change the rules. Well, people of personal faith are not as willing to do that. And fourthly, a higher power can be a source of comfort, peace, and, of course, strength. I can't do this on my own, but there is someone out there to help me. And what's interesting is if you look way up at the top, the most popular 12-step programs of recovery are what? Faith-based. And so, Rahab's life is just simply another story of how when we let the Lord God become our personal Lord, our lives are changed for the better. Whoever or whatever we value in our lives as the highest is ultimately what we worship, and depending on who or what we worship, it will shape our behaviors. Luke 12, 34, and Matthew 6, 21, put it this way, word for word, so they were probably having a common source, says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What does that mean? Where, where your treasure is, that what you value, you'll begin to love. How many people here like salmon sandwiches at church suppers? I'm glad that you like them. I am not a big fan of salmon sandwiches. But there was this one time at a church supper in my home church where all that was left to eat was salmon sandwiches. And I said, I don't like them. And my grandmother Breen said to me, A, that's all there is to eat. And B, if you eat it ten times, you'll like it. <laughs> so, I now, when there's nothing else, will absolutely eat salmon sandwiches. Ah, oh, they're not my favorite. They will probably never be my favorite. But they are edible and actually can be enjoyed as I got older. As I ate them, that stupid ten times she made me do it. But it's interesting, you see, within the Christian faith, we actually believe that we can train our appetites and desires. We don't need to be enslaved to them. Oh, I don't like that. We'll try it ten times and see. My grandmother knew that I could learn to eat it even if it would never be my favorite. And yes, she was right. Rahab 
So, when, so what we treasure will shape how we live. Rahab gave up loyalty to Jericho and her king and religion and cast her and her family's future into the hands of the living God. And while we don't know all the details, what we do know is, if we read closely, right at the end, they saved Rahab and her family's life, but they weren't in the camp. They were, they, they camped just outside the camp. They weren't part of the family or the Israelite tribe yet. But something happened over the next period of time so that what we know is that she ended up joining the tribe. Salomon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rina. Now, anybody know what, where, why Boaz is famous in the Bible? Ruth and Naomi, all the men in their lives have died. They were, there is no social service network. They were in Moab, and Naomi says, I'm going home to my family. And Ruth came along with her. Ruth was not an Israelite. And to make a long story short, because Boaz was a connection, he ended up becoming their kinsman redeemer. She, he married her, and yes, they had a baby. Messiah's family tree. How did that happen? By trusting and following the Lord God, she and her reputation and her life was transformed from disgrace to a place of honor. So when we want to change, don't focus on what you want to change. Don't eat that cookie. Don't eat that cookie. All you're thinking about is the cookie. I'm thinking about my mother's oatmeal coconut cookies and the saliva starting to run in my mouth. This is not going to help stop eating the cookie. What do we do? We stop thinking about the cookie. We think about who we are, whose we are, and what we're supposed to be doing. And we all know when you get busy, anybody here ever got so busy and you were doing stuff that you thought was so important that you forgot to eat? Of course, we've all done that. We need to keep our focus on the Lord. And when an addiction research shows we can't just stop doing bad behaviors, we need to change what we value and then get busy valuing it and our behavior changes as a byproduct. You want to be more patient? Think about how patient God is with us. And thank the Lord for his patience. And then as we begin to recognize and understand the depth of God's patience with us and our silliness, we'll all of a sudden start being more patient with people around us. Because they, we understand what it's like to be the person who needs patience and second chances and forgiveness. So when we worship the Lord God and we internalize the character of God, God's character will begin to be reflected in us. Oh yeah, remember what it says in Genesis? Adam and Eve were made in the image of God. It's God's plan for us to reflect God's character. Now, as we do this, we also need to understand every decision that we make is both an act of worship and an act of sacrifice. I don't know about you, but I'm not going to live forever, and I'm pretty sure neither are you. So we are limited in time, we are limited in space, we can only be one place at one time. But have you noticed in our secular world today, everyone wants to do everything? And sometimes we run around so much trying to do everything, we don't do anything very well. We need to understand that every decision we make is an act of worship and an act of sacrifice. Because if you're going to do one thing, you can't do another. I was in grade 9. I was seriously thinking about being an electrician. But when it came to source course selections, 
there was this conflict between my taking shots and history and music. Can you guess what I chose? History and music. Now, looking back on my life now, I think God was involved in that. I don't know if you've noticed, but every week I'm a little involved in leading worship. Do you think a little bit of not a little bit? But studying music and understanding music helps me to lead better, not just because I sing loud. Not anybody can do that. But to actually understand the music. Although, if you were paying attention to me today, I was getting the lyrics all wrong. I sort of officiated at the wedding last night, and I might not have gotten enough sleep or something. I don't know. Anyway. But the music helped. And then, with the study of history, have I ever used historical illustrations in my sermons? Except every week? The reality is, I think God was training me. And so the only, what do I do when I wish I had more electrical knowledge? I call Brian Chaluka. Or Dave Zimmerman. The reality is, for my life, that was the right thing to do. So do not fear an act of worship. This is what I'm going to focus on. As long as it's of God. And be, if you're going to have to cut out some other, th other things, don't fear that. It's probably the appropriate thing God wants us to do. Now, like Rahab, let us make choices to listen to and follow Jesus' teachings. Because those who hear Jesus' teachings and put them into practice are like those who build their lives on a rock. The storms and the rains will come, and you'll be okay. Then get battered a bit, you'll survive. If you build them on the sand, which means you hear Jesus' teachings and ignore it, it may be easier, but there's going to be a great crash when the storms and the rains come. And so, it is important that we not choose what is easiest and most comfortable to do. Rahab, it would have been much easier for her to simply turn, turn in the Israelite spies, but if she'd done that, she'd have been dead with all of her friends and neighbors. But she saw and trusted in the Lord. And she made the more difficult choice of trusting in the Lord God. And as disciples of Jesus, let us choose to sacrifice that is what is comfortable and easy for what is obedient to God's will. Now, does that mean we need to turn into monks and nuns? No, I'm not saying that. But let's not lead just look lives looking for what's comfortable and easy to do all the time. Because if we do that, it will nurture kind of self-centered living. And a self-centered living taken to an extreme where we just do what makes us feel good in short term is, of course, what the definition of an addiction is. And I don't know if you've noticed, but in our Western civilization, we're living in the midst of an addiction epidemic. Couldn't find the numbers for Canada, but I did find the numbers for the United States. In World War II, over four years, 416,801 deaths. I said, why is it 801? So I went checking some other numbers. It's within about 100 people, no matter what study you look at. Drug overdoses in the United States, over four years, from 2020 to 2024, 416,800. We in North America and south of the border have lost as many people to self-inflicted drug overdoses as were the lost fighting the Second World War. And if you think Canada is any better, Canada has similar numbers. Western civilization has a problem. That's why there is such desperation around safe injection sites. Whether they're going to turn out to be a good thing or a bad thing, time will tell. I don't want to get in the middle of that debate. But the issue is clear. We have an awful lot of people dealing with addiction. We need to give up, sacrifice a life of comfort and ease because ultimately it is a death sentence. 
Now, do I mean that people who are dealing with addictions have some sort of moral weakness? No. It's more than that. There are medical, chemical reasons. There's all kinds of stuff going on that we probably only half understand. But the gospel of Jesus Christ that takes a prostitute named Rahab and turns her into a hero of the faith is what is needed today. Like Rahab, let us as disciples of Jesus realize that those who worship, whoever or whatever we worship, will shape our behaviors. Serving the God of the Bible, our Creator, is the most fruitful way to worship because as our Creator, He knows us better than we know ourselves. Let us all real, so realize that every decision we make as finite human beings is both an act of worship and sacrifice. And so let us sacrifice lives of comfort and ease for the hard lives of loving service. The roof's finally almost done. Bert, you must be happy. Now, working on it. Still have that to pray about, but we'll see. One thing at a time. But do you remember when that downdraft happened? I was here with the camp staff. Carol, and you were here. Yeah, I, know, I didn't remember the precise date, but I knew it was this week. All I know is, it was not fun to look out that front window and see a tree lying on Mercedes' car. But once the storm was over, what was interesting is we all went out. People started checking on each other. Are you guys okay? Everybody all right? Then we started dragging branches off the road so, so vehicles could get down the roads. Then I hear chainsaws start running. And then, as we realized what's on the roof, people started showing up to help take the wood off the roof, including one young the guy who used to come to youth group and said, Jim, how are you? He used to be young and short and kind of not all that helpful. He's now much bigger and stronger and was very helpful. And we got things cleaned up. And people were out there driving up and down the roads, picking up people's other branches off the side of the road and taking them to the dump off place. It was hard work, but do you remember what that felt like? Tick Lyle, and you guys had, you piled a bunch of branches on the side of the road, and before you got to move, your neighbors picked them up and took them up to the dump off place, didn't they? Yeah, Kyle stopped by and picked them all up. Yeah, Kyle and Kathy. So, that was hard work cleaning up, trust me. I was there, and most many of you were there. The reality is, after doing all that hard work, nobody, people were just relieved that people were safe, and there was a sense of meaning and purpose when you care about other people and do something hard. This is, might sound weird, but at something, a thing came on the, on, the, on the radio as I was driving up. It was a, a, an older Christian uh, leader. They said, what is the one message you want to leave the next generation? And it was really interesting what he said. He said, shut off your screens. Start paying attention to the people around you and loving them. And pay attention to God. And as you know God, you will know how to love them. And your lives will be much more full. Are we accidentally worshipping screens? I say that looking at myself and my screen time and showed up on my iPad the other day. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we come to you not as people that have it all figured out. We come to you as people in search of you and your way to guide us into a life well lived. God, help us to remember who and what we value the most and worship will shape our lives and our behavior. We know that it is in you that we worship and find life. But when we allow our own passions and desires to leads to addiction and too often death and destruction. God, we come to you today and we seek to find and discover your life and your calling for us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And we don't serve a God who's always talking about how he doesn't love us. We have a friend in Jesus who wants us to come to us with our sins and shortcomings and give us a new life. Stand and sing this hymn.
to find an appropriate and fair and good solution for dealing with the staining that's in the seal. Meanwhile, God, as we thank you for last week's camps, we pray a blessing on this coming camp. Lord, has mentioned that there's a music camp is as big as we've ever had with a lot of new campers, but we've got less staff than we've had before. And I mean, some of them aren't quite as musical as some of the ones we've had before. So God, be a blessing and guide the, all the staff with that. We also think of the uh, Della and Algonquin Adventure, who are currently right now traveling on the highway to get to Algonquin before dark. Give them safe travels and camping. We also think of next week, Sydenham, and we pray for the water level to be safer and go down and slow down a bit, um, but still be high enough to make it work well. We pray for rain to settle down for all the farmers because so many crops, even as I was a Caro, so many crops and fields are just underwater. God, it's a hard year, and I pray that you would be helping us with that. And we do also continue to pray a blessing upon Mike and Abby and Abby and just be with them, especially on the first anniversary this year, today. And Lord, as we pray for our churches here at Hope and our partners in St. Andrews, we ask that you would bless us and lead us and help us to figure out ways to bring your message of good news to a society who's starving for second chances and new life. And we pray that you bless not just us, but all the neighboring churches as well, that as we together and individually lift up Jesus, people would be drawn to you, Lord, and not to us. Meanwhile, God, even though we've prayed for so many situations and so many people and things, we know that there are many other needs. So in the silence of this moment, we lift to you any other situations that we have you upon our hearts and minds. Lord Jesus Christ, hear our prayers. Answer according to your will, power, and might. We ask in Jesus' name for the power of the Holy Spirit to the glory of God the Father. And now as we go from this worship service, not because of any strength or abilities we have, we can go in peace because of the God that we worship and who loves us and forgives us and helps us. So let's stand together and go.